A cure for all cancers. Maintenance parasite program. You are always picking up parasites. Parasites are everywhere around you. You. Get them from other people, your family. Yourself, your home, your pets, undercooked. Meat, and undercooked dairy products. I believe the main source of the intestinal fluke is undercooked dairy products and meats. After we are infected with it this way, we can give it to each other through blood, saliva, semen, and breast milk, which means kissing on the mouth, sex, nursing, and childbearing. Family members nearly always have the same parasites. If one person develops cancer, the others probably have the intestinal fluke also. They should give themselves the same deparasitizing program. Do this once a week. You may take these at different times in the day or together. 1. Black Walnut Hull. Tincture extra strength, to teaspoon on an empty stomach, like before a meal or bedtime. 2. Wormwood capsules, 7 capsules, with 200 to 300 milligrams wormwood each once a day on an empty stomach. 3. Cloves, 7 capsules, about 500 milligrams. Each or fill size double zero capsules yourself once a day on an empty stomach. 4. Take only thine at night. The only after effects you may feel are due to release of bacteria and viruses from dead parasites. These should be promptly zapped. Children's Parasite Program. Black Walnut Tincture Extra Strength. Children follow the same parasite program as adults through day 5. On day 6. Instead of two tablespoon, take the following: agents nacinamide, under six months one fourth teaspoon fifty milligrams, six months to five years one fourth teaspoon fifty milligrams, six to ten years one teaspoon one hundred milligrams, eleven to sixteen years one half teaspoon five hundred milligrams. The niacinamide, not niacin is to help detoxify the alcohol in the tincture. You may crush it and put it in a spoonful of honey, if necessary. Occasionally a bit of niacin gets into the niacinamide tablet and causes a hot flush. It is harmless and soon passes. Even though the parasite program is very beneficial to children, who tend to pick up parasites more often than adults, it should not be continued on a maintenance basis due to the alcohol content. Have children deparasitize twice a year, or whenever ill. In case of childhood cancer, however, a much more vigorous program should be followed. Give 2 to 10 tablespoon tincture as quickly as the child can take it. Follow this, several hours later with the mop-up program. Wormwood and cloves. Increase dosage one day for each year. For instance a four-year-old would follow the adult program until day four, then stop. Again, it is not advisable for children to be on a maintenance dosage of wormwood and cloves. Taking them during their routine deparasitizing, or when ill, is best. In case of childhood cancer, it is not necessary to use increased dosages, as with black walnut tincture. Cleanse pets too. Pets have many of the same parasites that we get, including Ascaris, common roundworm, hookworm, trichinella, strong eloids, heartworm, and a variety of tapeworms. Every pet living in your home should be deparasitized, cleared of parasites, and maintained on a parasite program. Monthly trips to your vet are not sufficient. You may not need to get rid of your pet to keep yourself free of parasites. But if you are ill it is best to board it with a friend until you are better. Your pet is part of your family and should be kept as sweet and clean and healthy as yourself. This is not difficult to achieve. Here is the recipe, Pet Parasite Program. 1. Parsley Water Cook a big bunch of fresh parsley in a quart of water for 3 minutes. Throw away the parsley. After cooling, you may freeze most of it in several one cup containers. This is a month's supply. Put one tablespoon parsley water on the pet's food. You don't have to watch it go down. Whatever amount is eaten is satisfactory. 
All dosages are based on a 10 pound, 5 kilo cat or dog. Double them for a 20 pound pet, and so forth. Pets are so full of parasites, you must be quite careful not to deparasitize too quickly. The purpose of the parsley water is to keep the kidneys flowing well so dead parasite refuse is eliminated promptly. They get quite fond of their parsley water. Perhaps they can sense the benefit it brings them. Do this for a week before starting the black walnut hull tincture. 2. Black walnut hull tincture, regular strength, one drop on the food. Don't force them to eat it. Count carefully. Treat cats only twice a week. Treat dogs daily, for instance a 30 pound dog would get 3 drops per day but work up to it, increasing 1 drop per day. Do not use extra strength. If your pet vomits or has diarrhea, you may expect to see worms. This is extremely infectious and hazardous. Never let a child clean up a pet mess. Begin by pouring salt and iodine 14 on the mess and letting it stand for 5 minutes before cleaning it up. Clean up outdoor messes the same way. Finally, clean your hands with diluted grain alcohol, dilute 1 part alcohol with 4 parts water. Grain alcohol is actually ethyl alcohol that has been made by fermenting grain. In some countries sugar cane is used to make ethyl alcohol. A common brand in the United States is ever clear. But be careful. The smaller flask sizes are polluted with solvents from the pumping and filling processes, no doubt. Choose the 750 ml or 1 liter bottle which is, evidently, bottled differently. Be careful to keep all alcohol out of sight of children, don't rely on discipline for this. Be careful not to buy isopropyl, rubbing alcohol for this purpose. Start the wormwood a week later. 3. Wormwood capsules, 200 to 300 mg wormwood per capsule, open a capsule and put the smallest pinch possible on their dry food. Do this for a week before starting the cloves. 4. Cloves, put the smallest pinch possible on their dry food. Keep all of this up as a routine so that you need not fear your pets. Also, notice how peppy and happy they become. Go slowly so the pet can learn to eat all of it. To repeat, week 1, parsley water. Week 2, parsley water and black walnut. Week 3, parsley water, black walnut, and wormwood. Week 4, Parsley water, black walnut, wormwood, and cloves. Note 14. Povidoniodine, topical antiseptic, is available in most drug stores. Pets should not stroll on counters or table. They should eat out of their own dishes, not yours. They should not sleep on your bed. The bedroom should be off limits to pets. Don't kiss your pets. Wash your hands after playing with your pet. Never, never share food with your pet. Don't keep a cat box in the house, install a cat door. Wear a dust mask when you change the cat box. If you have a sand box for the children, buy new sand from a lumber yard and keep it covered. Don't eat in a restaurant where they sweep the carpet while you are eating, the dust has parasite eggs tracked in from outside. Never let a child crawl on the sidewalk or the floor of a public building. Wash children's hands before eating. Eat finger foods with a fork. If feasible, leave shoes at the door. Solvents are just as bad for your pet as for you. Most flavored pet foods are polluted with solvents such as carbon tetrachloride, benzene, isopropyl alcohol, wood alcohol, etc. Don't buy flavored pet food. Pets add a great deal to human lives. Get rid of the parasites not the pets, unless you are ill. Zapping Parasites Although the herbal parasite killing program is highly effective against parasites, you should also kill them electrically. Each method has its own areas of greatest effectiveness. You may build a zapper or purchase one. It is energized by a 9 volt battery. Some people can feel a minor tingling, others feel nothing. After 7 minutes take 20 to 40 minutes off. During this time viruses and bacteria will emerge from dead parasites. 
zap a second time. Then take another break of 20 to 40 minutes. Finally zap a third time. You have just killed all the viruses, all the bacteria, and all the parasites including flukes that the zapper current could reach. The few remaining are stuck in gall stones, kidney stones, abscesses, or in the bowel contents. Increasing the voltage does not help. Only 2 tablespoon dose of black walnut hull tincture extra strength reaches them in these locations. That is why you should use both methods. Triple zap once a day until you are well. Don't wait until you have everything to begin. Start as soon as you get each item. Consider your body like a flower garden. Tiny insects are eating your leaves and petals. They are laying eggs that hatch into hungry caterpillars, spinning cocoons and emerging into new adults continually. You can't wait for anything. You must kill whatever you can as soon as you can in order to save as many petals and leaves as possible. Tapeworm Disease We all have tapeworm stages in our bodies, probably going back to childhood when we ate dirt. Every tumor, benign or malignant, has a tapeworm stage in the middle of it, even including warts. Growing a tumor around a tapeworm stage may be nature's way of protecting us from it. It is not normal for these stages to hatch and develop further. Their purpose is to stay dormant. And perhaps they do little harm this way. But I have found, using the synchrometer, that tapeworm stages make malonic acid. This is a powerful inhibitor of your metabolism. It cripples your Krebs cycle, the high gear of your energy producing machinery. Dr. Otto Waburg found, in the early decades of the 20th century, that inhibitors of the Krebs cycle cause tumors to grow. So it is very important to kill the tapeworm stages in your body, and in your tumors, even though they are responsible for the neoplasm, tumor, not the malignancy. Cancer is a progression of developments. First, the mass is merely a benign growth, a neoplasm. It is instigated by a tapeworm stage. Later, the mass is invaded by the intestinal fluke causing it to become malignant. Tapeworm stages do not come unaccompanied, either. They bring some very harmful bacteria and viruses with them. In sufficient numbers, they can make you feel quite ill. Streptomyces, a fungus-like bacterium is one of the worst. Wherever I detect streptomyces, a tapeworm stage is not far away. The herbal parasite program, taken in a very high dose kills many tapeworm stages. You simply take 8 tablespoon black walnut hull tincture extra strength, rest for an hour, then take another 8 tablespoon black walnut hull tincture extra strength. After each dose, take one tablet of niacinamide, 500 milligrams to detoxify the alcohol. This treatment could make you woozy, do not drive a vehicle afterward. Also take 10 capsules of wormwood and 10 of cloves, slowly and carefully, to keep it all down. This treatment could save your life, if you are terminally ill. Yet, even this very high dose parasite program is not effective against all tapeworms. Duff tapeworms. A few varieties of tapeworms, like Echinococcus granulosus and Echinococcus multilocularis, have larvae inside their larvae. And even these second generation larvae can have more larvae inside them. These internal larvae are shielded from all things that might harm them. That is undoubtedly why they are not eradicated by zapper current or the very high dose of parasite herbs. The innermost larvae are called hydated sand. Testing with a synchrometer reveals that in some persons, unfortunate enough to have these tapeworm varieties, hydated sand is still present and alive after all these treatments. E. Granulosis is the most common variety to survive it all. It is found the world over, infesting sheep, cattle, pigs, horses, goats, and dogs. But what harm would a few leftover stages of tapeworms do? With most of them dead, surely your tumors should stop growing and your health should improve. Certainly there is much less malonic acid produced. But the filamentous bacterium, Streptomyces, which accompanies each larva, 
does a great deal of harm. Streptomyces can spread through your body like a virus, perhaps it even hosts a virus. Streptomyces is not merely a nuisance invader like Candida. Streptomyces uses up your nucleic acid bases, adenine and hypoxanthine. It makes nitrites out of nitrates, leading to nitroso compounds which cause mutations. It makes a strong protease that can digest your tissues. It makes substances that stops protein manufacture by your cells. It makes ammonia out of your urea, just the opposite of what should be taking place. It has powerful immune suppressant action on T cells. This is no ordinary bacterium although it is present in the soil everywhere. Unless you kill every grain of the hydated sand and other left over shielded larvae, you cannot get well. But as soon as you succeed, all Streptomyces species disappear the same day. To kill these larvae, the cyst must not be opened to let out the mischief makers, but merely penetrated to kill the contents. Fortunately, we have found two substances that can penetrate a succession of membranes to kill the shielded larvae within, as well as any trapped eggs in other locations. They are ozonated olive oil and L-cystine. We will discuss them shortly. But first, are there other parasites besides some tapeworms that can survive our treatments so far? Yes. Ascaris. The curious case of Ascaris. If you do not get well after the herbal parasite program and the zapper treatment, you can assume you have either left over tapeworm stages or survivor Ascaris eggs. Ascaris infests animals and humans from pole to pole of this planet. It is safe to say that all dogs and cats have it and all humans have it from time to time. Domestic animals and humans each have their own variety of Ascaris, yet can host the other varieties, too. Horses have Ascaris megalocephala. Pigs have Ascaris sum. The human variety is Ascaris lumbricoids. Ascaris does not attach itself to you, it hardly even moves. It simply lies still in your organs absorbing nutrients and eventually filling up with eggs. When you kill Ascaris worms by zapping or with the herbal recipe, they are mortally wounded. They are dying, but the eggs inside them are not. They were sheltered. Within a day these trapped eggs begin to leave the dying worm. Soon hordes of eggs are dispersing in your body again. And in another 24 hours they are beginning to hatch into larvae. You can detect this as it happens with a synchrometer and test slides of eggs, larvae, and adults. Of course, you are zapping and taking the herbal parasite killers. But again, these do not penetrate the Ascari's body to kill what is inside. It could take weeks for the dead Ascari's to be totally disintegrated so no more eggs are being sheltered within. Surely, a few Ascari's eggs, still escaping into your body could not do much harm since the overall problem has been greatly reduced. This is not so. The eggs, even if unfertilized, may do more harm than the worms. Ascari's eggs bring three very important pathogens that spread throughout your body, Rhizobium leguminosarum, Mycobacterium ovium, intracellular, and the common cold virus, adenovirus. A flood of these is responsible for night sweats and a general feeling of illness. As soon as the last Ascari's egg is gone, these pathogens are gone, too, and the following night becomes free of sweating. If your night sweats come back, you know Ascari's eggs are present again. And in 24 hours, unless you kill them, they will hatch into larvae and start the whole cycle over again. It takes about three weeks for large parasites like Ascari's and tapeworm larvae to disintegrate completely and be cleared from your tissues. If eggs or scolices are continually released during this time, the cycle of infection cannot be broken. Fortunately, the same two substances that can penetrate tapeworm larvae can also penetrate Ascari's worms and mop up after them, whether dead or alive. Strangle the stragglers. Here is the three-week mop-up program for both tapeworm larvae and trapped Ascari's eggs. Ozonated olive oil, three tablespoon taken once a day. L-cystine, 500 milligrams, two capsules, three times a day. 
you can easily make your own nozonated oil. Purchase a nozonator, sea sources and a small bottle of olive oil. Pour off an inch or so. Attach an aerator to the end of your ozonator hose and drop it to the bottom of the olive oil bottle. Choose a ceramic or wood aerator, available at any pet store, the plastic varieties release benzene. The bubbles may make the oil flow over the top. In this case, pour more of it off. Turn the ozonator on before dropping the hose in the bottle. Ozonate for 20 minutes or longer. When done, cap the bottle and store in freezer until you are ready to use it. It melts quickly when needed. Would other oils work? Possibly. I have not researched them, though, since they cannot be trusted to be free of benzene, petroleum pollution. Measure your dose accurately. You may put it on vegetables and have it with your meal. Ozonated oil gives you no noticeable side effects, but it should not be taken more than necessary. One could expect the ozone to jump across from oil molecules to your fat molecules, aging them too soon. Fortunately, the dose is small and may be directed at the intruders before it is directed at you. The cysteine should be L-cysteine, cysteine hydrochloride or simply free cysteine. Do not get D-cysteine or D-L-cysteine which are unnatural. Taking this supplement gives a few people side effects, perhaps due to its penetrating anti-parasite property. You could have fatigue, nausea, dizziness. If you have serious side effects, reduce the dosage. On the other hand, cysteine may make you feel better than you have in many months. The cancer sufferer is quite deficient in cysteine and suddenly supplying it could put the body into a state of euphoria. In this case, you may even double the dose. Cysteine has other important benefits for you. It counteracts the radiation we all get from living on this planet, called background radiation. This might even explain why supplementing animals with cysteine had the effect of lengthening their lives substantially. Cysteine is a heavy metal detoxifier, perhaps through the formation of glutathione. It is a precursor to glutathione and deserves a permanent place on your supplement list. Nevertheless, supplementing with cysteine should not be overdone. Even if you have good side effects, reduce the dosage after three weeks to one a day. If you had bad side effects, reduce the dosage after two days to whatever you are comfortable with. After three weeks, you can assume that all leftover ascaris eggs are gone. But you can't assume this for tapeworm stages, some are still locked inside your gallstones. These can be reached with a series of ozonated oil liver cleanses. After three weeks of mopping up, you may stop. Do the mop up once a week thereafter, on days when you are doing the maintenance parasite program or the day after. To summarize, what you'll need for killing all your parasites, including tough ones, and mopping up after them. 1. Black walnut tincture, an alcohol extract of the green hull, for alcoholics, a water recipe is given. 2. Wormwood, in capsules. 3. Cloves, fresh ground, together with size double zero empty capsules. 4. Zapper. 5. Ozonator, to ozonate olive oil. 6. L-cysteine. Optional, ornithine, arginine. Parasites gone, isopropyl alcohol next. Now that you have killed the intestinal fluke and cured your cancer, what's next? Two tasks remain. 1. Stop getting isopropyl alcohol into your body. 2. Get rid of the heavy metals and common toxins in your body, diet and home. This will heal the damaged tissues and start your tumors shrinking. Isopropyl alcohol is the antiseptic commonly used in cosmetics. Check all your cosmetics for the word propanol or isopropanol on the label. It is usually put on the label, since it is not currently suspected of causing cancer. I don't know if propyl compounds like propamide, propastamide, isopropyl gallate, or calcium propionate could be converted by the body to isopropyl alcohol, so don't take chances. Do not use anything that has prop in the list of ingredients.
Don't give your discarded cosmetics to anybody. Don't save them. Don't have them in the house anywhere. Throw them out. Remember, 100% of cancer patients have the solvent isopropyl alcohol accumulated in the liver and in their cancerous tissues. People without cancer do not have isopropyl alcohol in their livers. Look at the case histories. Often one spouse has cancer, you can note that she or he has isopropyl alcohol in the adult fluke in the liver. Orthophosphotyrosine is present in an organ like the lung where the cancer is developing. But the other spouse does not have cancer although he or she shares the parasite. For him or her it is only in the intestine. There are no eggs or other stages anywhere. There is no solvent present. Here is a list of common body products that may have isopropyl alcohol in them, cosmetics, shampoo, hairspray, mouthwash, mousse, body lotions, shaving supplies, and, of course, rubbing alcohol. If in doubt, throw it out. Note 16. Many people use cosmetics with isopropanol in them and do not develop cancer. The isopropanol is detoxified for them by their livers. Eating moldy food with aflatoxins in it poisons the liver's ability to detoxify propanol. Although body products give us our highest concentrations, isopropyl alcohol is in our food, too. One primary source is flavor or color. These are extracted with solvents. The concentrate extracted is called a spiceolo resin. Naturally, the solvents should be removed before the final product is used. But nothing can be removed completely once it is added, so there are regulations governing the amount left. Amounts are stated in ppm, or parts per million. 50 ppm would be like 50 drops out of a million drops or roughly one drop per quart, or litre. This excerpt is from the Code of Federal Regulations CFR. 21 CFR 173.240-4194 Addition Isopropyl Alcohol Isopropyl alcohol may be present in the following foods under the conditions specified, a in spice or low resins as a residue from the extraction of spice, at a level not to exceed 50 parts per million in lemon oil as a residue in production of the oil, at a level not to exceed 6 parts per million. C discusses its use in hops extract. Another reason for isopropyl alcohol pollution, and other pollutants in our food are the chemicals used by manufacturers to sterilize their food handling equipment. 21 CFR 178.1010 4194 edition, Sanitizing Solutions. Sanitizing solutions may be safely used on food processing equipment and utensils, and on other food contact articles as specified in this section, within the following prescribed conditions, a. Such sanitizing solutions are used, followed by adequate draining, before contact with food. Note rinsing or drying is not required, b. The solutions consist of one of the following to which may be added components general recognized as safe and components which are permitted by prior sanction or approval. Now comes 1 through 43, permissible sterilizing solutions, including several with isopropyl alcohol, like, 25, an aqueous solution containing elemental iodine, CAS, registry number 7553562, potassium iodide, CAS, registry number 7681110, and isopropanol, CAS registry number 67630. In addition to use on food processing equipment and utensils, this solution may be used on beverage containers, including milk containers and equipment and on food contact surfaces in public eating places. Then in paragraph C19, the exact concentration of the iodine is specified. Nowhere is the concentration of the isopropanol specified. It can be as strong as desired. Figure 19 U.S. Regulations on Sterilizing Solutions Even if there were regulations governing removal of sanitizing solutions, the overwhelming truth is missed, that nothing can ever be completely removed after it has been added. 
or perhaps the lawmakers didn't miss this fact. Perhaps they believed that small amounts, too small to measure with an ultraviolet spectrophotometer, could surely do no harm. The good news is that isopropyl alcohol leaves your body, by itself, in five days after you stop getting it. Isopropyl alcohol is a pollutant in cold cereals. Stop buying all cold cereals. Even the most natural cold cereals are polluted. I haven't tested every cereal on the market, but I have tested so many that you should not take a chance on a single one. See recipes to make your own. Why is it so important to get rid of isopropyl alcohol if you have already gotten rid of the intestinal fluke, and are on the parasite maintenance program? Because reinfection can occur so quickly. Dairy products and fast food hamburgers are not heated high enough to kill metasercaria, the shelled stage that can survive extreme heat and cold in ponds. Even when you ask to have your hamburgers cooked very thoroughly, you run the risk of having your hamburger removed from the grill with the same spatula that just put the next batch of raw patties on the grill, defeating your efforts. Within 24 hours the fluke stages are in your blood, some of which are hatching into adults, and before your next maintenance dose of black walnut tincture they are in your liver and your orthophosphotyrosine is back. But without isopropyl alcohol this doesn't happen. With isopropyl alcohol it is inevitable. You should not stay on high doses of parasiticides as a substitute for avoiding isopropyl alcohol. Read all labels on the body products you buy. Keep a lighted magnifying glass with you for this purpose while shopping. Isopropyl alcohol polluted products. Throw these out even if isopropyl alcohol is not listed on the label. Shampoo, even health brands. Storbed fruit juice, including 100% natural and health store varieties. Storbed and bottled water, including distilled, mineral, health store or self-dispensed varieties. Cold cereals, including granolas and health food varieties. Rubbing alcohol, mouthwash, vitamin supplements and herb extracts unless tested. All shaving supplies including aftershave, prescription and over-the-counter drugs unless tested, white sugar use confectioners sugar or brown sugar, but add vitamin C to detox if I'm old, decaffeinated coffee, postum, herb tea blends single herb teas are okay, hairspray and mousse, carbonated beverages, cosmetics, see recipes. You can make many of these products yourself, free of toxins, see recipes. Remember that isopropyl alcohol is also called propyl alcohol, propanol, isopropanol, and rubbing alcohol. Endogenous isopropyl alcohol means made in your body. There is another, even more fiendish source of isopropyl alcohol. Certain bacteria of the Clostridium family make it. A portion of our colon bacteria are Clostridium varieties. It is considered normal. Yet, children's bowel contents tested negative for the six Glostridium species I searched for. Instead they had Bifidus varieties a good bacteria. I think absence of Glostridium and presence of Bifidus is truly normal, even for adults. Perhaps only a few varieties of Glostridium make isopropyl alcohol. I have found only one reference to this in the classical literature. It states that Glostridium toacum makes isopropyl alcohol in its metabolism. Perhaps this species is also present, although I cannot test for it yet. In any case, I usually see all six species of Glostridium in the intestinal tract of cancer patients. Only in cancer patients have Glostridium species invaded the upper parts of the intestine, too, not only the lower parts so much more isopropyl alcohol may be made. In fact the esophagus and stomach are frequently colonized as well. The synchrometer easily detects the isopropyl alcohol being made in the intestines when Clostridium is present. Evidently, the bacteria burrow through the walls of the intestine, find the tumor site, and colonize there, producing isopropyl alcohol. Is it any wonder that the body runs out of detoxifying capability for this antiseptic? Note 17. Based on three children, ages 2, 5 and 6, 
two specimens tested per child. A aflatoxin B. Whenever isopropyl alcohol is in the liver, I find aflatoxin B, a mold byproduct, in the liver as well. Aflatoxin B is known to be extremely carcinogenic. My interpretation of this coincidence is that aflatoxin B is inhibiting isopropyl alcohol detoxification. Of course the reverse may be true, isopropyl alcohol could be inhibiting detoxification of aflatoxin. Either way, if you stop eating moldy foods your aflatoxin B level will be zero. Some foods with aflatoxin B are beer, nuts, bread more than a few days old, overripe fruit, and many bulk grains. Surprisingly, very moldy foods like cheese show no signs of aflatoxin B. Maybe removal of aflatoxin is the reason there are documented cases of freedom from cancer after changing to the macrobiotic diet. Malignant tumors have both the fluke and isopropyl alcohol present. Before that, the tumor was benign. If you can prevent tumors from forming at all, you would never have to worry about malignant ones. The formation of tumors. A tumor begins as a small overgrowth of tissue. You may notice it simply because it presses against its neighboring organ giving you strange sensations. When it is examined or scanned, the doctor may call it an adenoma or neoplasm, or just plain mass. Although scientists have worked for 100 years on the causes of such little growths, there is no conclusive explanation yet. But by analyzing this little growth with the synchrometer, its composition can be determined qualitatively. When its composition is compared to that of other masses, in other persons, in other organs, common denominators can be found. And if removing these common denominators for patients results in shrinkage of these benign masses, a recipe for curing your tumor disease can be formulated. A brief sketch of how we see tumor disease progress will be given here so you can begin your healing and prevention program. The cause of tumor disease. These are the common denominators of all the masses or growths I have investigated, even including warts. There are only about a dozen, not hundreds upon thousands as we are told. Tapeworm stages, Ascaris worms, Clostridium bacteria, copper the metal, cobalt the metal, vanadium inorganic, malonic acid and derivatives, fungus species. This is not an unmanageable list. Compared to the thousands of chemicals on the carcinogen list compiled by anti-cancer institutions, this is simple. What do the tapeworm stages do? We have already stated that they produce malonic acid or somehow cause it to be made by the host, which is us. Malonic acid stalls the Krebs cycle, the major energy producing mechanism going on within our cells, an event that leads to tumor formation. But that is not all. Tapeworm stage is also host bacteria. One of the constant companions of tapeworm stages are streptomyces, fungus like bacteria. There are hundreds of species, they are well known for making streptomycin, an antibiotic. But they should not be making such compounds in our tissues on a steady basis. The side effect of streptomycin is stopping protein formation. This is exactly what happens in the tumor. When streptomyces are present, the synchrometer can detect no RNA, which is the nucleic acid that leads to protein building. Healthy cells make RNA constantly. Ozonated oil plus cysteine is the best way to kill tapeworm stages because together they are also effective against streptomyces. What does Ascaris do? The primitive metabolism used by Ascaris and other parasites is called the glyoxylate cycle. Ascaris glyoxylate cycle commandeers our Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is what humans use to burn food into energy. Killing Ascaris stops this, and helps speed up our metabolism in a single day. Another thing that Ascaris does is to destroy all the vitamin C in the organ with the tumor by oxidizing it, removing a hydrogen atom. To be useful, vitamin C must have reducing power, it must be able to pin a hydrogen atom onto other compounds. When Ascaris is killed, Vitamin C is immediately present again, and in proper reduced form. 
Ascaris harbors Rhizobum leguminous arum. We have been taught that Rhizobum is a rather lovable bacterium, busily changing nitrogen gas into nitrates in the nodules along the roots of leg implants. But in our bodies, the nitrate gets reduced to nitrite, nitrites form nitroso compounds, and these cause mutations. Rhizobium is also capable of making DNA, which is necessary for tumor formation. Fortunately, killing ascaris with ozonated oil plus cystine also kills rhizobium. Another bacterium harbored by ascaris is Mycobacterium ovum, intracellular, two species are mixed on my specimen. Although I have not discovered any of its metabolic pathways, it is easy to notice the big improvements in health when it is killed. Night sweats are immediately gone. Ascaris has still more tumor-related activities. To understand them you have to know about extensive studies done in the 1930s. At that time the structure of cholesterol was being discovered, and some of its byproducts were suspiciously similar to the coal tar products known to cause cancerous tumors in mice. Hundreds of coal tar products were studied over a 10-year period, and one of the worst was 20-methylcholanthine. 20-methylcholanthine is considered one of the most potent carcinogens ever discovered. One-tenth of a milligram, approximately one-tenth of a fly speck injected into the skin of mouse, only once, could produce tumors up to eight months later, filling the mouse with big round balls that ended its life. Just one dose? To my amazement the synchrometer detects 20-methylcholanthine in tumor cells when ascaris is also present. How have we escaped our demise by this route for so many years? We have hosted Ascaris from our early beginnings as humans, although having household pets is probably a new lifestyle. I don't know the answer, but obviously eliminating Ascaris infestation is a most important task. I believe it can be safely concluded that tapeworm stages and Ascaris together with their associated bacteria, initiate our tumor disease. Later, Clostridium bacteria and various toxins and carcinogens make their deadly contribution. What does copper do? There is no tumor, benign or malignant that does not have inorganic, toxic copper, that is detected with a synchrometer. On blood tests, it is easily seen that non-food copper depresses the serum iron level. Ultimately copper is lethal because without sufficient iron, in a properly reduced state, kept that way by vitamin C, our detoxification systems fail, red blood cell formation fails, energy metabolism fails, we fail. Metallic copper comes into our bodies with water that has run through copper pipes, from metal tooth fillings, and from plastic tooth fillings polluted with copper. Copper has a great affinity for sulfur and uses up our chief sulfur compounds, glutathione, cysteine, taurine, and methionine. And eventually the sulfur that must stay combined with iron in our most vital organs is used up. Fortunately it is easy to eliminate toxic copper from our bodies by removing it from your water pipes and your mouth. Copper accumulation in cancer patients has been noted for a long time, but it was thought to be due to the cancer itself. My findings show the reverse, that copper accumulation causes tumor growth. And in fact, the accumulation, far from being due to the cancer patient's genetic tendency, can be easily stopped just by changing the water pipes and getting copper containing tooth fillings removed. Copper levels fall at once, letting iron levels come up in less than a week. Immediately blood building can resume. And as copper levels continue to go down, the invasive fungus growths also decline. What does fungus do? Quite a few fungi in their toxic products, called mycotoxins, have been studied in connection with cancer. The synchrometer routinely detects aflatoxin and patulin, which are mycotoxins, at the tumor site. Aflatoxin causes liver tumors. All cases of jaundice I have seen in liver cancer patients are due to aflatoxin. The only remedy I know of is to stop eating all grains and nuts, in any form. Other foods, especially fermented foods, could be contaminated with it, too, because the mycotoxin is not alive and is not damaged by cooking. 
Patulin also has a history of scientific research and use, as an antibiotic. I routinely detect it at a tumor site, but its preferred organ is the parathyroid. It plays a detrimental role in the body's defense against tumors. Tumor defense in the body. Every person I have tested who is without tumors, has tumor necrosis factor TNF in their parathyroids, but nowhere else. Every person with a tumor does not have TNF in the parathyroid glands. But the reason is clear. Patulin is in the parathyroids, somehow preventing TNF from being made. As soon as patulin disappears, and this could happen as soon as one day after killing the fungus and stopping eating it, TNF reappears in the parathyroids, ready to go to work. No sooner is it back in the parathyroids but it shows up at the tumor sites, too, doing its best to shrink the tumors there. If you should eat or grow aspergillus fungi again, the kind that make patulin, TNF immediately disappears. So it is rather a fragile system. Our habit of eating rotten fruit, not right off the tree, and letting fungus germinate in the intestine, constipation, keeps us inundated with patulin. The bruised parts of apples may have as much as one parts per million patulin. Stopping eating bruised fruit and clearing the bowel of fungus with black walnut hull tincture extra strength, to teaspoon doses effective, immediately eliminates patulin in the parathyroids. Now the tumors can shrink. But the forces favoring growth may still be stronger. What else is making them grow? Cobalt, vanadium, malonic acid, several bacteria varieties, and assorted carcinogens. What does cobalt do? Very little is known about cobalt toxicity. It was even given as medication in the past, for anemia. But the treatment was worse than the disease. Inorganic cobalt blocked oxygen utilization so that the body was fooled into believing it was at the top of a tall mountain, where the air is very thin, poor in oxygen. The body's adaptation to altitude is to make more red blood cells. This appeared to cure the anemia by making more red blood cells. But blocking oxygen utilization has the same effect as being anemic, so nothing was gained. Long ago numerous scientists discovered an important fact. Any lowering of oxygen use by an organ favored tumor formation in that tissue. A steady trickle of cobalt to your tumor could be expected to support tumor growth. Another toxic effect of inorganic cobalt is in the liver where the two main blood proteins are made, albumin and globulin. These two must be carefully regulated since they control the osmotic pressure in the blood vessels. They must add up to about 7 grams per deciliter. The total may get much too high, such as 10 grams per deciliter in multiple myeloma, or much too low, below 6, when terminal illness has progressed. Cobalt raises the albumin too high and keeps globulin levels too low. These derangements can be seen on a standard blood test. The toxicity of cobalt to the heart has been known for decades, it was made illegal in nearly all uses then. But gradually it has reappeared in more and more products. By allowing it in dish detergents and laundry detergent we now get a steady dose of it as a residue on our dishes and from our clothing which constantly massages cobalt into our skin. A ridiculously obvious and preventable source of cobalt is metal tooth fillings. But by replacing the metal with plastic, we have frequently not removed the cobalt. It is usually present, either as a component or contaminant of the plastic restoration. When both metal and plastics are meticulously removed, blood albumin and globulin levels correct themselves, often in just three days. And a life-threatening situation is turned around to recovery. What does vanadium do? Vanadium, like cobalt, causes the red blood cell count to go up, much too high. In fact, polycythemia, a rare blood disease, is primarily vanadium toxicity. How this happens is unknown. But when the red blood cell count is over 4.7, for men or women, the synchrometer always detects cobalt or vanadium in the bone marrow. Vanadium is asserting its toxicity in other organs, too, in the liver, 
and in the tumorous organ. In the liver, vanadium toxicity has the opposite effect of cobalt toxicity. Now the albumin production is too low, while globulin goes to high. Since globulin is less effective than albumin as an osmotic water attractant, water is allowed to leave the circulation and simply seep into the surrounding tissue. It is called edema and becomes a fatal condition. Vanadium is also the cause of the frequent mutations seen in tumors, in the p53 gene. It does this by combining with nucleic acid to make vanadial complexes. A healthy p53 gene is necessary for the gene's tumor suppressor action, which is to produce a substance that prevents tumors from forming. By removing vanadium from your dental wear, both metal and plastic, the vanadial complexes disappear and p53 gene mutations disappear, too. Then how could a patient without any tooth fillings develop tumors? We have seen many children with cancers whose dentition was intact. But their tumors were filled with vanadial complexes. And as the disease became terminal the additional toxic effects of vanadium were easily spotted, much to low albumin and high globulin and an exceptionally high red blood cell count. The children's vanadium came from one, chronic exposure to car exhaust, a source that constantly invaded their home, two, a household gas leak, or three, leaking refrigerant I suspect fossil fuel is often part of the refrigerant. These are important sources of vanadium for adults, too. Note 19. One might expect that having both toxins would cancel the toxicity. Indeed, the blood proteins are often in normal range for cancer patients, the problem being masked by this dual toxicity. But in other ways they do not cancel their toxicity, and each takes its toll on your health. Vanadium leaves the body, even from the vital organs, in a week after clean air is supplied and artificial materials are taken out of the mouth. These simple moves can turn around a terminally ill patient. What does malonic acid do? It is toxic, and a lot of research has been done on it. Malonic acid was found to inhibit the use of oxygen by animals' respiration as early as 1900. By 1930, Otto Warburg had found that anything that inhibited respiration could cause tumor formation. But it was never suspected that tapeworm stages release malonic acid, or that plastic teeth seep it or that we even eat it in certain common foods. The synchrometer detects it in every tumor based on approximately 500 tests. New research is needed to clarify the exact role it plays in tumor growth. What do bacteria do? We have seen that some of these common denominators of tumors suppress our oxygen use. Some cause mutations. Some interfere with iron availability some lower our detoxifying capability, some destroy our vitamin C, some drastically lower our immunity, some prevent us from making tumor suppressors. But, in spite of all these tumor-promoting forces, a tumor could still not grow unless it had sufficient DNA to grow on. Imagine a garden. It has been tilled, seeded, fertilized, and is completely ready to grow. But each seed needs one more thing, water. For our cells to divide they must have DNA, the gene material with which each gene reproduces itself. Certainly, our cells can make their own DNA from RNA, but resources for this are limited. And it occurs only in the nucleus, at an appropriate time, at a pace that allows for replenishment of the RNA. In tumors, the synchrometer detects DNA all the time. This may seem normal, because all of our cells have DNA, but I consider it abnormal because DNA is typically not detectable by the synchrometer. Perhaps because it is buried in the cell nucleus. Only in tumors, and the ovaries, does it show up, leading me to believe that when I do detect it, it is out of place and out of control. How can DNA is the water? be continually supplied for cell multiplication? The answer is bacteria. Only a few bacteria varieties out of the vast numbers inhabiting this planet are able to make DNA using vitamin B12 like humans do. These bacteria are certain species of Clostridium, 
rhizobium and lactobacillus. There may be more which I have not yet researched, but when these three are banished, DNA formation stops, and abnormal cell division must cease. These bacteria have found their way into the human body, particularly the intestinal tract and dental crevices. And from there, when low immunity allows, they travel to the young tumor and colonize it. Clostridium is the hardest to eradicate. Evidently it invades the tumor cells and is not killed. Perhaps immunity is too low. Once inside, I suspect its DNA making enzymes seep out into the cytoplasm where our copious amounts of R, N, A, R, changing it all to DNA. And with an ever-present supply of DNA, the last requirement for unrestrained growth is met. So some bacteria can cause your garden to be watered in overabundance. Another bad thing bacteria can do is transport viruses into your cells. This is because bacteria can themselves be infected with viruses. So when the bacteria manage to invade your cell by penetrating the membrane, not an easy job, the virus gets a free ride. Periodically viruses get released from those bacteria inside your cell, putting them in position to attack your DNA. When foreign DNA joins yours, it is called transformation. Scientists have studied transformation to determine when and how it causes tumor growth but don't have all the answers. To me, it seems likely that bacteria and their viruses, such as we discuss here, are probably the transforming agents sought by scientists. Bacteria implicated in other growth factors. Although the DNA making bacteria seem most important, other common bacteria contribute to tumor growth. For instance if an organ tests positive to DNA, I assume tumorous growth is occurring. If that organ then tests positive to CA, 125, a cancer marker, I know from experience the synchrometer will find Salmonella typhimurium. Always. The conclusion is that S. typhimurium is a causative factor for both CA, 125 and the tumor. Vanquish tumor causing bacteria. The Clostridium family can be stopped in the digestive tract by taking betaine hydrochloride, C sources. 1500 mg a day is an average dose. Of course, a dental source will recolonize the digestive tract, so you must stay on this daily dose for protection until the dental source has been removed. This will also clear up Staphylococcus. The Shigellas, Salmonellas, and D. Kali can be cleared up with the bowel program. To prevent reinfection, observe safe dairy rules. How benign tumors turn fatal. Tumor growth is a grand conspiracy between parasites, bacteria, fungi, copper, cobalt, vanadium, malonic acid, and assorted carcinogens. Yet the human body is big and strong. There are many mechanisms within our immune systems to fight these intruders. But if the tumor enlarges or new ones arise, we know these mechanisms are failing. We should be coming to our body's assistance rather than shrugging it off as merely benign. At some time, the benign little mass may become malignant. This means that I observe orthophosphotyrosine is present. Plus I always observe multiplying fasciolopsis stages as well as isopropyl alcohol now. Did the fasciolopsis stages suddenly discover the tumor the way a hermit crab discovers an unused shell? My detection of growth factors in tumors and even the presence of a few fluke stages there suggests we should be much more concerned about them. Perhaps the distinction between benign and malignant tumors is deluding. Like the distinction between a loaded and unloaded gun. When ammunition is available, no gun should be ignored. We should really view tumor formation, or tumorigenesis, with the same caution as cancer, even though it is slow at first. It could begin to accelerate, doing more and more harm. Yet the body has coped with tumorigenesis a very long time, from the beginning of humanity, as evidenced by our body's ability to produce tumor necrosis factor TNF, tumor suppressor genes, and to repair mutations. What has gone wrong in the last century to permit such a flurry of tumors and cancers? 
even though tumor growth is ancient, perhaps malignancy is a recent phenomenon. Perhaps this past century has produced the overload of heavy metals, solvents, and globetrotting parasites required to spark this epidemic. Yet knowing what starts our tumors gives us the power to stop them, whether benign or malignant. Preventing tumors will prevent cancer. Tumors are complex structures, which appear to be associated with fungi, metals, bacteria, tapeworms, ascaries and toxins. Being complex, you would think they would be fragile, and removing just one building block would topple them. But the opposite is true, together they form a highly durable opponent for your immune system. The best way to beat tumors is not allowing them to start. How to prevent all tumors? 1. Kill tapeworm stages and ascaries regularly and completely with your parasite killing recipe plus mop up. 2. Stop eating foods that contain malonic acid. 3. Get away from coppered water. 4. Stop using cobalt containing products. 5. Avoid vanadium in fossil fuel contamination of the air in your home. 6. Have only safe dental wear in your mouth since you must suck on this day and night. 7. Stop Glostridium invasion with a betaine hydrochloride supplement. 8. Don't eat moldy food. I have neglected the subject of carcinogens, though they are all so important. In fact, it may be the carcinogen that chooses the organ to be targeted for a tumor. This role keeps them from being common denominators. Certainly, urethane pollution of plastic dental wear could be very significant. Urethane was studied intensively for a decade and found to be a very strong tumor inducer, especially in the lungs. Certainly, the legions of chemicals found to increase the risk of cancer are playing their roles in obscurity. I have also neglected the concept of raising immunity. This is the practice of giving interferon, giving interleukin, giving thymosin, giving bacterial antigens, and giving many other entities to raise or stimulate the cancer patient's immune powers. The concept is excellent, and would certainly bear results if only the setting were correct. But in a setting of continued parasitism, bacterial invasion, and metal toxicity, it is hopeless, or at best temporary. Of the eight preventive measures, none is very difficult to carry out. Review As a result of our civilized lifestyle we live in petroleum-heated houses, drink water carried in copper pipes, eat food stored to the limit of freshness, wash our clothes in cobalt-containing detergent, are exposed to parasites we disperse all over the globe, place toxins in our teeth to constantly suck and anoint ourselves with unnatural chemicals. Carcinogens pervade our modern environment. An overburdened liver gets an overdose of aflatoxin B, reducing its ability to detoxify isopropyl alcohol. Clostridium gain a toehold in your bowel, intensifying the isopropyl burden and causing it to accumulate. About this time human chorionic gonadotropin HCG, one of the first cancer markers discovered, appears. Next Clostridium and other bacteria invade one of your weakened organs, and start producing DNA. A small tumor starts to form. It is benign. The intestinal fluke, fasciolopsis, facilitated by isopropyl alcohol, finds it can leave the intestine for the liver and, it can reproduce itself from beginning to end inside your body not needing a snail. Miracidia and other fluke stages swarm in your body. They produce a supergrowth factor, orthophosphotracine, which makes cells multiply. The adult fasciolopsis is in the liver but stages and growth factor are far away in the new tumor. It is now malignant. If solvents other than isopropyl alcohol are consumed, Fasciolopsis follows a different, non-cancerous, path. Just how solvents facilitate the parasite's life cycle needs more research. Do solvents dissolve the shells of parasite eggs in the intestine, letting them all hatch? Do solvents disarm your immune system? Certainly, the tiny baby stages, Miracidia, 
get into your blood and travel everywhere in your body. They land, become radio, and reproduce into thousands more. They finally turn into circaria, metacircaria, and finally adults. Adults in your liver, if you have isopropyl alcohol in it, causing cancer, adults in your pancreas, if you have wood alcohol in it, causing diabetes, adults in your thymus, if you have benzene in it causing HIV disease, adults in your brain, if you have toluene or xylene in it, causing Alzheimer's disease, adults in your kidneys, Hodgkin's disease, uterus endometriosis or prostate chronic prostatitis if you have other solvents there, adults in your skin if you have Kaposi's eyes sarcoma. I had to mention these diseases even though this book is just about cancer because you should know what a scourge this parasite is, and how deadly it is to have both the intestinal fluke and solvents. In every case, 100% of these diseases that I have seen, both have been present.